Hope Just, Chapter 4, Henry Street. The Henry Street Settlement House had stone steps with wrought island iron railings. At the bottom of the steps sat a group of girls playing jacks and a woman rocking a baby in a baby carriage with her foot. Violet followed Myrtle up the steps to a heavy wooden door. I think we just go in, said Myrtle. Violet had a lifelong training in good manners, and it did not include going into other people's houses without knocking. She hesitated, but Myrtle pushed the door open and went in. Violet followed her with some trepidation. The house had an ordinary hall with a carpet and umbrella stand. Upstairs, some people were singing. Violet couldn't understand the words. They were in a foreign language. Violet looked questioningly at Myrtle. Myrtle shrugged. I've never been inside here before, she said. Violet went over to one of the doors and tentatively pushed it open. It was a parlor, rather like the one back home. Had been before it was turned into Stephen's recuperation room. There were some bookshelves, a mahogany table, and a sofa, and some armchairs, covered in red velvet. The man, a man was sitting in one of the chairs, absorbed in a book. He had a thin, harried look, as if he hadn't gotten enough sleep in several days, several years. Violet stepped hesitantly into the room. She could feel Myrtle following her just behind her. Excuse me, she began. The man started. Although Violet noticed, he closed the book on his hand to keep from losing his place, just as she would have done. Good evening, ladies, the man stood up as if Violet and Myrtle were in fact ladies. How do you do? Very well, thank you, Violet curtsied, and Myrtle did the same. All this politeness was such a waste of time. She just wanted to see her sister. I was wondering if you might know where I may find Miss Chloe Mayhew. As soon as she said Chloe's name, the man dropped the book. He bent to pick it up, examining carefully for damage. Violet wondered if he was going to answer her. She studied him while he, was look he, while he wasn't looking. He was about as tall as father, nearly six feet, but much thinner, and was wearing a ready-made brown suit and a soft collared shirt that father would not have been caught dead in. In fact, Violet wasn't sure she had ever seen a man out in public wearing a soft collared shirt. He had light brown hair and was just that was just a little longer than it should have been. But the strangest thing about his face was an angry white scar that ran from the corner of his left eye down into his bushy mustache. Violet found it difficult to keep her eyes off it. Though, of course, she knew that good manners required her to do so. Finally, she decided the book wasn't, finally he decided the book wasn't damaged. I hope you ladies don't think me discourteous if I express some curiosity as to who might be inquiring for Miss Mayhew, he said. Won't you please be seated? Violet sat down on the edge of the sofa that the man indicated. The cushion creaked as Myrtle sat down beside her. Violet wanted him to hurry up so he could and go find Chloe for her. But of course, it wouldn't be polite to say so, and Violet could see that this man was very polite. He spoke in the polite way that boys would talk to the girls at the dancing school that Mother made Violet go to. But unlike the boys at dancing school, he seemed quite comfortable doing it. Violet glanced at Myrtle, wondering if she was making out what she was making out of the stranger. Myrtle raised her eyebrows in a sort of facial shrug. I'm, sh I'm Miss Violet Mayhew, said Violet to the man. I'm Miss Mayhew's sister. And this is Myrtle, um, she had forgotten Myrtle's last name. Davies, said Myrtle. And I'm Theo Martin, said the man, sitting down. It's a pleasure to meet you. He clasped his book between his thumb and forefinger. And Violet realized, with surprise, that those were the only two fingers he had on his right hand. She looked quickly away and saw Myrtle trying to do not to notice the missing fingers as well. I'm afraid Miss Mayhew isn't here said Mr. Martin. She isn't in New York, actually. Violet felt as if she had been punched in the stomach. That Chloe wouldn't be in New York was a possibility that hadn't occurred to her. But I have letters, she protested, starting to reach for them, and then remembered that they were in her bloomers. 
not really a place you could reach for in public in a public parlor. I thought she lived here. She could feel tears starting to starting in her eyes and fought valiantly to keep them from spilling out. A lady never cried in public. She felt someone touch her and looked with surprise to see Myrtle's hand resting on her arm. Mr. Martin leaned forward, looking concerned. I'm sure your sister is in excellent health, said Miss, May Miss Mayhew. She's simply not in New York. Please don't worry. Violet tried to smile to reassure him accident and accidentally jarred one of the tears loose. It trickled down the side of her nose. She went to Washington, D.C. over a year ago to work with the National Women's Party on the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. She drove off in that alarming machine of hers. He smiled fondly. Hello, Miss Mayhew said that she loved nursing, but that winning the vote for women was more important right now. Violet had managed to get control of her tears. Chloe's been a suffragist ever since she was in high school, she said. Even then, she worked on petitions and things. Well, it's a very worthwhile cause, said Mr. Martin. Violet looked at him surprised. You think so? Of course, denying equal suffrage to women is a terrible injustice. Violet was astonished. She had heard people say this before. Chloe, chief among them. But she never heard a man say it. She hadn't really thought a man could want votes for women. Father certainly didn't. And none of the men from the bank he invited over for dinner, Mr. Russell and Mr. Rice and Mr. All the rest of them did. As for Stephen, she hadn't really known Stephen that well. He'd been away since he, she was little, first at Cornell University and then at the war. For the last three years, he hadn't voiced any opinions, even though father had made mother dress him up so he could take him to the polls to vote on election day, just the same. My father says women's suffrage is a damn fool crazy idea, Violet blurted out and then clapped her hand over her mouth. I beg your pardon. Mr. Martin smiled. Every great advance in human society started out as a damn fool crazy idea. Er, yes, said Violet, feeling the conversation was getting off track. Myrtle apparently thought so, too, because she said, Do you have an address for Miss Mayhew in Washington, sir? An address? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Martin put his book down. Are you from New York with your parents, Miss Mayhew? And what about you, Miss Davies? Where have you sprung from? And don't they miss you there? Violet and Myrtle glanced at each other, alarmed. Mr. Martin had been speaking so normally that Violet at least had forgotten that he was an adult and likely to be interested in these sorts of details. She was trying to think of an evasive answer to this while still not looking at Mr. Martin's missing fingers or his scar, when Myrtle said, She just wants an address to write to, I think, Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin still looked suspicious, so Violet hastily agreed. Yes, just to write to. My father and mother don't, that is, they and Chloe had an argument. Mr. Martin frowned. And you, Miss Davies? The door opened inward, halfway, and a woman's voice called. Theo! Come, please help me with the, get these boys out of the chimney. Excuse me, said Mr. Martin, standing up. I'll just be a minute. Please wait right here. As soon as he had left the room, Violet said, we'd better go. At exactly the same moment that Myrtle whispered, let's get out of here. Violet smiled in spite of her anxiety. She and Flossie used to say the same thing at the same time, too. She looked out in the hallway. There was no sign of Mr. Martin anywhere or anyone else. They rushed out the front door, careful not to slam it behind them. When they were out in the street again, Myrtle said that Mr. Martin was going to trot me over to the Institute and then put you on the first train back to Pennsylvania. What are you going to do now? Should we go to Washington to find your sister? Violet had been thinking just that, though she had no idea how to get there. Don't you have to go back to your training institute? I told you, I try not to spend too much time there. But don't they want you there, Violet? Still wasn't sh sure exactly what a girl's training institute was. But if it was anything like a school, they would. Yes, said Myrtle unconcernedly. Do you have enough money for the train to DC? To DC? I don't think so, said Violet. How far is it? 
A long way, said Myrtle. More than 200 miles. Violet didn't have to do the math. At two cents a mile, she did not have enough money. How will I get there? We'll find a way, said Myrtle. Let's go to the train station and see what we can figure out. But what about your school? Violet persisted. She couldn't believe Myrtle was just going to wander away. It isn't a school, said Myrtle testily. It's a training institute. A school would be a place where you learn stuff from books so that you would do something important with the world. in the world. My mama sent me to school when she was alive. She didn't want me to go someplace where we study ironing and dusting, knowing your place. Mama didn't need for me to know my place. Myrtle started out the speech sounding cranky, but at the end, there was a dangerous squeak in her voice, and Violet was afraid she was going to start crying. She never knew what to do when people started crying. Fortunately, Myrtle didn't. Come on, Myrtle said. Let's go to the train station.